Discover the tips and strategies that will help you achieve your retirement goals. I'm your host, James Canole, and this is the podcast dedicated to helping you retire well. It all starts right here on Ready for Retirement. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Ready for Retirement. I'm your host, James Canole. On today's episode, we're going to be talking about withdrawal rates, whether it's the 4% rule or a Guyton's Guardrails framework, and really asking ourselves the question of, is the allocation and are those rules still applicable considering everything that we've seen in the last few years? Everything from low interest rates to high interest rates, everything from a pandemic to high inflation to just some of the global things that are happening, are those withdrawal rules still applicable? So that's the main thing we're going to be talking about. And there's actually two components to today's episode, and it comes from a listener. Today's listener question comes from Will. Will says this. He says, hi, James. I have a couple questions I was hoping you could answer. Number one, in one of your earlier episodes, you addressed the tax benefit of ETS versus traditional mutual funds. You seem to prefer ETFs. My question is, if ETFs are more preferable compared to traditional mutual funds, why are mutual funds more prevalent? The second part of the question is this. Uh, Will goes on to say, it looks like the Guyton's Guardrails paper was published in 2004 with an update in 2006. That was almost 20 years ago, and since then we've had some major market events from the 2008 crisis, years with low interest rates, the pandemic, and now significant inflation. I assume you think the principles are still valid, but my question has to do with his asset and percentage mix. Do you still agree with them? Is there an update planned? Thank you. Well, thank you, Will. I think those are excellent questions, separate questions. So we'll quickly dive through the first one about ETFs because I think there's a pretty simple answer, but then I'll have a more uh, nuanced and more in-depth response to the second part of the question about the guardrails paper and is that still applicable? So let's start with the question about ETFs. If ETFs are better, hypothetically, then why is it that more mutual funds are held than ETFs? Now, before I jump through this, I do want to clarify Both mutual funds and ETFs can be incredible products. So something being an ETF versus something that uh, is a mutual fund, that doesn't by default mean it's a good or a bad product. I just tend to think there are some tax benefits. Now, I tend to think there are some tax benefits to ETFs as opposed to mutual funds. Now, if you're doing all your investing in an IRA or a 401k or a Roth IRA, those tax benefits don't apply to you. You're not paying taxes on anything inside of those accounts, but there are still some other benefits of ETFs. Listen to a prior episode where I talked about that, but to the question of why, why are there more mutual funds than ETFs? There's a handful of reasons. Number one, if you look at 401ks, that's where a huge part of Americans hold their wealth or a huge swath of all the wealth that is here in America in funds. A lot of it is held in 401ks. Now, I don't know what the exact number is, but something like 99.9% of all 401ks have mutual funds, not ETFs. I can only think of one, maybe two providers that even use ETFs in their 401k lineup, and they're relatively small providers. So when you look at something even as basic as that, of where do people have the best, the best option to put their funds and invest it, 401k is probably the easiest place for most people to do that, and 401ks are, to a large extent, an overwhelmingly large extent, all going to be mutual funds. The second reason, ETFs were created in 1993, so not even 30 years ago. Now, that seems like maybe it was a long time ago until you consider this is a really slow-moving industry and when you consider that the first mutual fund was created in 1924, so almost 100 years ago. The first mutual fund was the MFS Massachusetts Investors Trust. So when you look at that, there was just way more opportunity to invest in mutual funds than there was ETFs. And if you look at everything from index funds to ETFs to passive management versus active management, even when you look at something and say it's very clear that this is probably a better option for most people, the industry is very slow moving. The shift happens very gradually, and you're seeing a huge uptick today in the use of ETFs versus mutual funds. But... Mutual funds have been around almost 100 years, whereas ETFs have been around almost 30 years. So there's a significant leg up there. And I would say the third reason has to do with incentive structure and how this advisory industry originally worked. It was through sales. 
Today, it's not uncommon to have firms like Root Financial, so my firm, that provide full-service wealth management solutions where I don't necessarily care what mutual fund or ETF or product is being used. I simply want to use what's best for my clients, and that's because I'm not getting paid by the mutual fund or the ETF company. Years ago, even today, but more specifically years ago, that was not the case. Mutual funds were sold through brokerage firms. Brokerage firms almost existed to sell their companies' products. So when you have that, and when you have only mutual funds that you can sell through, that tended to drive behavior in terms of advisors recommending the mutual funds that was created or packaged by their company, or at least structured in a way that it was going to benefit the company as opposed to the investor. So those are just some fast facts as we're looking at why are there still more mutual funds and ETFs? Again, both are great options. There's good mutual funds and there's bad mutual funds. There's good ETFs and there's bad ETFs. It's about finding the one that's right for you. So don't look at it as a good or bad black and white type of a thing, but that's some perspective to the first part of Will's question of why are mutual funds still more prevalent if there are some uh, obvious advantages to ETFs. Let's now go to the second part of Will's question I think is, is more important for today, which is you have this guardrails paper. This guardrails paper talking about how much can you safely pull from your portfolio and know that you're probably going to be okay at least over 40 plus years of potential retirement, but this paper is almost 20 years old. And since it was published, we've had the mortgage meltdown of 2008. We've had years with super low interest rates. We now have a year where interest rates are rising. We've had the pandemic. We have significant inflation. Are those principles still valid? And not just those principles, but is the asset mix that's recommended still valid? Well, let's look at this. The initial part of the guardrails paper, it looked at a portfolio from 1973 and beyond. And so you could look at that and say, okay, there's some, there's plenty going on there, but was it the same as today? No, it certainly wasn't. But I would argue is actually worse. I'm going to read right from the paper here. So this is quoting the guardrails paper where it says, these decision rules were systematically applied throughout a retirement distribution period beginning in 1973, chosen for its real-life perfect storm characteristics that included a severe market decline in the initial retirement years combined with inflation in the first decade of retirement that was three times the long-term historical norm. Then goes on to say, the use of this specific historical period definitely has its attractions. Chief among them is the severity of the real-life conditions faced by 1973 retiree and the early years of retirement, thereby allowing future retirees to have the confidence assuming they would not face even more adverse conditions. It is worth noting that the combined impact of inflation in the 1973-74 through 74 bear market placed a 1973 retiree in a more financially uncertain position after five years of retirement at the end of 1977 than a 2000 retiree found after 2004 following the 2000 to 2002 bear market, end quote. So in summary, what it's saying there is they're saying, hey, we chose this really, really horrible time starting in 1973 almost because that was the perfect storm of bad years in the market with high inflation knowing that if we could design a framework, design rules to see you through a period like that, even a period like 2000 to 2002, where the U.S. market lost half of its value, you would look at it and say, oh, well, at least it wasn't as bad as 1973. Here's some actual stats around that. If we look at 1973, the S&P 500 in that year was down 14.7%. For perspective, so far this year, the S&P is down about 18%, at least as of this recording. Well, it didn't end there. If in 1973, the market was down 14.7%, the very next year, it was down 26.5%. So two back-to-back double-digit losses in the market. Then in 1975 and 1976, it was up a little bit. And then in the fifth year, it was down again. And if you look from 1973 through the end of 1977, so after five full years, you had lost 0.2% per year in the S&P 500. So a negative return after five years. But that's only half the story. On top of that, you also had really severe inflation. In 1973, inflation ran at 8.7%. In 1974, inflation ran at 12.3%. Fast forward a few years, we're still high, but then it gets really high again. 1978, 9%. 1979, 13.3%. 1980, 12.5%. So not only is the S&P 500 losing value, but the cost of everything is going up in value. 
So this is what the authors of this paper are talking about when they said this was a perfect storm for a lot of retirees. And if we look at this, if you look at retiring in 1973 and said, okay, fast forward 12 years, how would you have done? You would have had a 0% real return on your investments. Meaning after 12 years, your investments did grow. But when you offset that by the impact of inflation, your real return was zero. That's about as bad as it can get. Now, it could theoretically always get worse. But as we look at this and look at just at different historical time periods, that's a horrible experience. Let's say you retire at 65. Well, you're retiring, you do what you want to do, but you're worried for 12 straight years because it's not until age 77 that you've broken even because for the first 12 years, you were actually underwater. When you look at your portfolio returns versus inflation, your real return was negative until you're 77 years old. Imagine being that retiree that's 65 at that time and having to wait through those 12 years. That's a very unnerving experience. So let's bring that back to today. Today, of course, inflation's high. It's not as high as it was in the 1970s, but it is still very high. Now, so far, year to date, the S&P 500 is down about 18% or so. I'm recording this episode in late November. So who knows what it does before the end of the year. But we've had a bad start to this year and even a bad full year. But I would not go so far as to say it was as bad as 1973 and beyond, at least in this moment. So this initial paper, the initials guardrails paper, it looked at that time period to say that was a perfect storm but we do want to look further than that. We don't want to just look at 1973. They went back all the way to 1928. One of the challenges is when you go back to 1928, you don't have some historical data for certain international markets and how they would have returned. You don't have data for certain parts of the investment markets that you could work within. So what they were doing is they took this data and they used the S&P 500 as a proxy for the stocks as opposed to the uh, the typical approach of let's have some stocks in the US, some international, some real estate, some value, some growth. They can't do that the longer they backtest just because there's not data on all that. But even if they use just the S&P 500 as the proxy for the entirety of the stock portion of a portfolio going back to 1928, it reduced how much you could take out of your portfolio a little bit. It wasn't the full amount that you could have taken, but it still worked. The principle still worked. So when you look at that, going all the way back to 1928, what was included in that? Well, for one, the Great Depression. That was just a massive downturn in the value of the stock market. So you had the Depression. You had World War II. You had the Cold War. You had presidential assassinations. You had Vietnam. You had inflation. You had stagflation. You had so much stuff since that, even just prior to the 1970s. And then from the 1970s and beyond, we just looked at this horrible time period from 1973 and beyond where this research shows you could really support a portfolio if you follow these decision rules, if you apply this more robust framework. Now, I want to go back to the Great Depression because a lot of people say, I want to make sure something can stand up to that because that was a horrible experience. Here's what people don't realize. The Great Depression was horrible for a number of reasons. People don't realize, though, that we had horrible deflation during that time. So from 1973 and the, the years following it, the challenge was the stock market was falling and inflation was rising. So the real return was even worse than it looked on paper because even if the market was, say, down 15% in a year, well, if inflation was down or up another 9 your real return was negative 24%. Well, with the Great Depression, there's no discounting the fact that the market downturns were horrible, but you look at a year like 1930. The deflation that year was 6.4%. So not inflation, but deflation, meaning prices reducing, which was in large part what caused a lot of that and the time it took to get out of the Great Depression. 1931, the year after, deflation was 9.3%. 1932, the year after that, deflation was 10.3%. So prices were moving backwards, whereas inflation, they're moving higher. So if you look at the Great Depression, you want to know what's the break even. If I was invested at the very peak of the market, which was in 1929, how long would it have taken for me to break even with my money? Well, it took about 14 years from a nominal standpoint. I'll often see people uh, quoting or reciting stuff saying, oh, it took 20 something years to recover from that. No, it didn't. When people are looking at those numbers, they're not factoring in the dividends that continue to get paid from the S&P or from the Dow Jones. So what you're looking at is people are just looking at the price return. So if the S&P was at 100, for example, and it dropped to 20, I'm just making numbers up, how long did it take for that 20 to return back to 100? Well, if all you're looking at is the price, you're missing out on dividends, which are a huge component of the return of the market going forward. 
So the total return, it took 14 years for the market to break even on a nominal basis during the Great Depression. And I say that because when you factor in deflation, so not inflation, but deflation, the real break even was closer to about eight and a half years. So still a really, really, really difficult experience. But I bring that up because that was actually shorter than the 1973 break even. From 1973, with the bad markets and horrible inflation, it took until 1985 to break even. If we go back to that retiree who retired at age 65, it wasn't until age 77 that they broke even on a real return basis. So I bring that back to this paper of is there a guarantee that that was going to be the worst scenario ever? Absolutely not. I'm sure we'll have another horrible scenario like that at some point, but it was pretty darn bad. So bad that it took longer for a real on a real basis, a real return basis, for your money to break even starting in 1973 than it would have in 1929 at the very height of the Great Depression. So going back, Will, to your question of do these principles still apply? Yeah, I absolutely think these principles still apply. The hard part of investing is we're never actually going to be able to predict what happens next. In 2018 or 2019, no one could have predicted the COVID thing. Um, Looking backwards, there's all these things that catch you by surprise. So who knows what the next thing is going to be? But can we apply a framework to the way that we pull money out of our portfolio that has worked during a time where there was not just bad market returns, but there's also horrible inflation? So two things that are working actively against you, your money declining and the costs increasing, that's something that we want to make sure this framework could work against. Now, Will, you also said, what about the specific percentage? What about his asset and percentage mix in this paper? To me, I actually don't give a tremendous amount of weight to those specific allocations. And that's not a knock on the way that he outlined them. But if you look at them, it's it's pretty simple. You know, 10% large value, 10% growth, this percent real estate, this. In, In other words, it's just designed to say, can you spread your money out? Again, I don't know Jonathan Guyton. If Jonathan Guyton's listening to this and saying, James, you're totally wrong. There is a very specific reason for those allocations. I'd be willing to learn there. But to me, what he is saying here is if we just spread our money out a little bit into different types of asset classes, is it 10% to large value or 12%? Uh, Is it 10% to large growth or 7%? Those things, in my opinion, are far less important than do you own allocations to each of those types of investments. I personally, when I'm investing client portfolios in my own portfolio, I'm not investing it exactly to the allocation that's mentioned there. And I'm doing that because I don't think that that's a prescriptive allocation that says everyone should do things this way. It's just if you're going to do some back testing, you have to start with something. And to me, that's more a way of saying if we spread out our money to these different types of asset classes, whether it's 5% or 6% or 7% or 4% to this one, yes, that will have marginal differences in each case, but I almost use this as a framework. And then I overlay that with what's the way, what's the best way to get the most total return from our investments long-term, knowing what types of asset classes tend to do best over time, as well as preserving enough of our money that if there's a horrible market downturn, we're going to be okay for four or five, six plus years because we've built in a really conservative sleeve door portfolio as well. So I almost like to look at it from multiple dimensions of yes, start with the framework. But to me, the most important aspect of Guyton's guardrails is understanding the withdrawal rules. Yes, it's the asset classes. Yes, it's making sure that you're spread out. That should be a given. The most important framework in my mind is how do you understand where you should pull money from to, to create income each year? How do you understand the rules that you need to follow? Of Can you increase income? Do you decrease income? Do you freeze withdrawals? Do you rise it, raise it by inflation? All of these things are the most important components of this research, in my opinion. And then on top of that, have a framework for how do you actually maximize the growth of the portion of your portfolio that's going to be growing for you over time? How do you maximize the preservation? How do you maximize the stability of the part of the portfolio that you might need for current consumption needs? And how do you do so in a way that you can continue to to meet those consumption needs regardless of what's happening in the stock market? So, Will, to your point, does the asset mix still apply? I would say yes, but not because it's the be-all, end-all. And more of to say, if you still diversify your money, own multiple types of asset classes, that's still the key to success moving forward. So I hope that was helpful. Thank you to everyone that is listening. If you ever think about this and say, gosh, this sounds really confusing. I would love some help with this. Reach out. 
you can find us at rootfinancialpartners.com. One of our advisors would love to connect with you, get a sense of what you're looking to do, and show you how we might be able to help you with your retirement planning goals. With that being said, thank you for listening, and I'll see you all next time. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Ready for Retirement podcast. If you're enjoying the show, please subscribe and let me know by leaving a five-star review. And as always, for a list of the notes and the resources mentioned in today's episode, you can find those at the Ready for Retirement website, which is readyforretirement.co. That's readyforretirement.co. And if you have a question that you would like for me to answer in a future episode, then you can also go to the Ready for Retirement website, readyforretirement.co. And there's a page called Submit Your Question where you can submit a question for me to answer in a future episode. Thanks as always for listening, and I'll see you next time.